Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. I first visited Earthsea as I was reading through the Ace Science Fiction Specials Series 1. A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin, 1968. It has a beautiful Leo and Diane Dillon cover. If you want to learn more about that one, you can check out this review. I wasn't much of a fantasy reader, but I loved Ursula K. Le Guin's writing. I was so impressed by this novel that I decided I wanted to read the rest of the Earthsea stories. And of course, you know I love cover artists and really good livery in my books. This omnibus is illustrated by Charles Vess, and you'll see his pictures throughout this review. But this review isn't about A Wizard of Earthsea. This is about the second book, the Tombs of Atuan. One of the things I really appreciate about Le Guin is that all of the books that I've read, either in the Hainish universe or Hainish cycle, or the Earth Sea world, regardless of being sequels or part of a series, they read like a singleton, a standalone. Each book really is a novel unto itself. Our protagonist is Arha, who will eventually be called Tenar. Ged, our young mage from the first novel, is in this novel, but I think that everything that you need to know about him can be found in context with this novel, and he doesn't really appear until about a third of the way through the book. This is the story of a young girl who by fate is destined to become a priestess in the tombs of Atuan. She is taken from her family and trained in this sacred order. The tombs are an underground labyrinth, a labyrinth where people have died. They protect treasures, and there's one treasure in specific that Ged looks for in this novel. Ged and Tanar are on a collision course in the tombs of Atuan. In this review, I don't want to tell you a lot about the story. I want to tell you more about Ursa K. Le Guin's thoughts on this story. There is an amazing afterword by Ursa K. Le Guin herself following the tombs of Atuan. I'm going to select excerpts from here to share with you. People often don't believe me when I say that when I wrote A Wizard of Ursi, I had no plans beyond that book. But it's true. I know. It says on the first page of the first book that Ged is going to be a famous mage with songs and epics about him, a dragon lord, archmage of Ursi, which all seems to promise sequels. But I just put that there so the reader would know this was a world where magic was powerful, where there were dragons, the world of fantasy. It's good to get that sort of thing clear at the start. I also put it there so the reader and I could be sure that this rather unpromising kid did have a future. So when I wrote the last words of the book, before ever he sailed the dragon's run unscathed, or brought back the ring of Aerith Akbi from the tombs of Atuan to Havnor, or came at last to Roke once more as archmage of all the islands of the world. What was in my mind was not a teaser for a sequel, but only a resounding, echoing closure to a story told. However, a writer sometimes writes a message for herself to be read when she begins to understand it. After A Wizard, I wrote the science fiction novel The Left Hand of Darkness. When that was done, I thought, what next? And looked around in my mind. There was Ged and his world, Earthsea, vivid and alive, ready to be explored further. And there was that interesting phrase about bringing a ring from the tombs of Atuan. The reason people don't believe that I didn't plan a trilogy from the start is that fantasy now suffers from endemic trilogitis, or the even more serious form of the disease, incurable seriesism. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings is largely responsible for this epidemic since its six books were printed in three volumes, a trilogy. I expect Earthsea is also to blame, although it ended up as six volumes too. But when I started The Tombs of Atuan, I saw it, as well as I can recall, simply as a sequel. And a change of gender. Ged would play a part in it, but the person whose story it was would be a girl. A girl who lived far from the cities of the archipelago, in a remote desert land. A girl who could not seek power as young Ged could or find training in the use of it as he did, but who had power forced upon her. 
a girl whose name was not given to her by a kind teacher, but taken from her by a masked executioner. The boy Ged, offered wisdom, refused it through his own pride and willfulness. The girl Tanar, given the arbitrary power of a goddess, was taught nothing about living her life as a human being. When I was writing the story in 1969, I knew of no women heroes of heroic fantasy since those in the works of Ariosto and Tasso in the Renaissance. These days, there are plenty, though I wonder about some of them. Be that as it may, when I wrote the book, it took more imagination than I had to create a girl character who, offered great power, could accept it as her right and due. Such a situation didn't then seem plausible to me. But since I was writing about the people who in most societies have not been given much power, women, it seemed perfectly plausible to place my heroine in a situation that led her to question the nature and value of power itself. The word power has two different meanings. There is power too. Strength, gift, skill, art, the mastery of a craft, the authority of knowledge. And there is power over, rule, dominion, supremacy, might, mastery of slaves, authority over others. Ged was offered both kinds of power. Tanar was offered only one. What I love about Ursula K. Le Guin is that she brings dignity and voice to people and to ideas. Ideas that can combat bias and prejudice. To follow the left hand of darkness with the tombs of a twan is amazing. Le Guin gives voice to gender in a number of facets. She looks at personhood and the traps that we have in our cultures and societies. How we force people into molds. How we have unconscious bias in the way we treat others. There is a purity to her writing, a sense of joy and release from bondage. In reading Tanar's story, I found her destiny to be oppressive. I think Le Guin was speaking to all of us who find that the hand that we've been dealt in life confines us, suppresses us. Can Ged liberate Tanar, and what kind of liberation are we talking about? Ultimately, I think this novel is about deliverance from oppression, whether it is prescribed or self-imposed. I give The Tombs of Atuan 9 out of 10. Highly recommended. Let's give the last word to Ursula K. Le Guin. What my readers tell me about the Earthsea books, all of them, all six of them, particularly what what young people tell me, or people who were young when they first read A Wizard of Earthsea, or, or the, the first trilogy. They tell me it helped them figure out their own way through life. That it was somehow useful to them. And that they could identify with Ged or with Tenar with the problems that they faced. That helped them with their own problems. And th this is something that it did not occur to me. I didn't know I was being helpful to anybody. I was just telling a story I wanted to tell, which obviously had very deep sources in my own life. And so it is wonderful to be told by your readers that they love your book because when they read it, they needed it. And it kind of came to them like a friend. And that is a lovely, a lovely thing to be told as a writer.